Coming up on this episode of Nintendo Cartridge Society. Eight years later, we're still not sure how many ice cubes are in this thing. It's dangerous to go alone, so the Nintendo Cartridge Society goes with you. Welcome to Nintendo Cartridge Society. My name is Patrick Ellers, and I am joined, as I am always joined, by my co-host, Mark Mitchell. Mark, how's it going? It's going great. I have been visiting family, and um, I have a nephew who, without any like prompting from me or anything, has developed a real interest in Mario and Mario ah. video games. And let yes. me tell you, it is such a delight but also really funny to me to have a genuine shared interest with a third grader <laughs> where yes. we can talk about Mario. Like, I think I'm blowing his mind a little bit with how yes. much I know about Mario and all of the Mario games that I've played. Yes. Cause you've played them all. <laughs> right. And like, I, I just don't think there's that many adults in his life that uh, right. <laughs> are able to talk about Mario uh, with such um, knowledge. See, I, I found this also to be true when uh, I was in Chicago for C2E2 this spring, uh, and I was able to go to uh, one of Sarah's niece's uh, birthday party and uh, was talking to both of them. They recently started playing Animal Crossing, and so they would start asking me questions uh, because I was like, oh, you know, I, I uh, you know, just kind of like, like, you know, have you... Uh, have you moved out of the tent? Are you? Do you have you put another uh, uh, room on your house? Whatever. And then they would be like, "How many bells do you have?" And I was like, "What?" <laughs> like, <laughs> I play this game so much, I paid off every single debt. I have an uncountable number of bells. But like they they were barely even like aware of like the deep <laughs> depression everyone was seeking into to uh, play this game during the early days of the pandemic. That's so funny. Yeah, it's been really. And I like yeah. uh, I got like my switch out and um we were playing like a little bit of Odyssey in two player co op which I had never done before and it's been years since I've really like turned yeah. on Odyssey. It's just been that that part of it's been and you know um other nieces and nephews I've been playing like Mario Kart with and they're just kind of reaching an age where that sort of stuff is interesting them. Um so I don't know it's been it's been fun. It's also just crazy to consider that like. For a lot of those kids, um, like Super Mario Odyssey came out when they were not alive. It's <laughs> true. Yeah, totally. Like, for, for, for a game that I'm like, oh, yes, that's the most recent, like, new 3D Mario game. Like, absolutely. That's, that's a new game. Nope. Came out 2017. Yep. Like, yeah. <laughs> that game is seven years old. Yeah. It <laughs> is pretty wild. Uh, and we will, of course, be talking about a lot more of that kind of stuff because uh, the uh, premise of today's show is that we are going to be looking back at the original uh, Nintendo Switch reveal event and pulling out all of the individual features that Nintendo was sort of touting as, uh, you know, what the new system was going to be about and sort of evaluating uh, which of them actually, uh, you know, became part of what the system actually was and what the state of all that is right now. But first, uh, if you would like to support us as we do this kind of thing, uh, you can head on over to patreon.com slash Nintendo Cartridge Society, where if you are following us at the 8-bit or 16-bit levels, you get access to our once-a-month episode of miniseries. We are currently making our way through Season 2 of NCS Arcade. Yeah, and uh, in just a couple of weeks, we're going to be recording an episode about Elite Beat Agents on the yeah. Nintendo DS. And we also have an episode to record, a listener email episode about Mega Man. Uh, we talked about Mega Man Dr. Wily's Revenge for the Game Boy in July. And just with Patrick being sick and travel and all that stuff, we haven't had a chance to get together to record that, but that will be coming very soon as well. And that will be available to everyone who is following us on Patreon, whether you are paying for uh, the, the Patreon or not. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you uh, have questions ever about the games that we're covering, uh, and you're not supporting um, at uh, a, a, a monetary level, um, you know, feel free to send us emails about those games. And then if you are uh, supporting us at the 4-bit level, you have access to NCS Detective Club, 
now. That's Mark and my Mark and I talking about the great uh, detective shows on television. Um, thank you to our new patron Fabio, uh, and thank you to all of our patrons. We appreciate you supporting us. Uh, however you do it. Um, and then if you are not already in our Discord, you should be, because that's where we're talking about Nintendo stuff basically all the time. Uh, so email us at Nintendo Cartridge Society at, at gmail.com, gmail and we will send you an invitation, and you can uh, chat with us to your heart's content. Um, all right. Um, Mark, any other table setting here, or should we just dive in? I think we're ready to dive in. Let's do it. So, Mark, why are we doing this? Well, uh, in April, Anthons posted in our Discord saying, quote, I think it would be also be interesting to take a look back at the first features revealed the Switch to see how many features they were focusing on had staying power, like the haptic rumbling with ice cubes or the IR sensor. And I really like this idea because I feel like when we're on the cusp, more or less, um, <laughs> of uh, new Nintendo hardware, and anytime like any video game hardware is revealed, you know they're always touting really specific things that are the marketing beats that they want to hit, and those things don't always end up mattering in the long term of the system. Right. Yeah. And like it, it's it's always interesting to sort of like reflect back on. The things that were very important as, as like part of the original marketing that like they didn't follow through on or things that actually were and do end up being very important. And like every now and then there's something that like seems antithetical to the original pitch of the machine. Right. Um, that ends up becoming the most important part of uh, the uh, systems like ecosystem. Uh, so we're kind of going to go go through this. Uh, presentation the original like January, what 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 date was this presentation? Do you recall? No, but January Janu tw January yeah. twenty seventeen, just a couple of months before the switch would be released. Yeah, fewer than two, like fewer than two full months before the system was released, we actually got like a a full rundown of it. Um, and so like the kind of stuff that we're not going to be covering here or not uh, going to be interrogating. It's just a sort of like basic Switch stuff, right? Uh, it has a, a, a dock, the Switch itself, uh, like the little screen is the console itself, Joy-Cons, Joy-Con grip, Pro Controller, all that sort of like hybrid functionality, um, all of that kind of stuff that was more or less revealed in the teaser trailer that came out in October. Um, with, that's That all feels like table stakes and is also just like, what the system physically is so like there's no way for them to get away from that i guess other than to say that like they never back down from unless we want to count the switch light but we they never back down from the concept of like it has joy cons and you can play it on the tv or uh in, in handheld mode yeah it's true the the switch light is an interesting um is an interesting wrinkle in all of that because it doesn't have detachable Joy-Con, and so there are certain games that you're not able to play it on. But I feel like... And you can't put it on the TV. You can't put it on the TV. But I, and I feel like the um, what never came to pass, obviously, is like the reverse, which there were also... I wouldn't call it necessarily rumors, yeah. but like discussion of for a long time. It's like, oh, should Nintendo, will Nintendo release a more powerful version of it that is just a home console and in that way like they never they definitely never did that like the high there there yeah. was the switch light but the hybrid like pr that was the premier model that was like what the switch was meant to do yeah i wonder like if they ever would have made a uh a non-handheld version of the switch one that always needed the tv um if that would be like any cheaper right for the, for like them to produce because it would require no screen right yeah that's right yeah i don't know um yeah that's interesting i mean playstation tr kind of tried that with the what was it the was it the discless v the vita tv or like the oh play yeah is that what yeah. it was yeah i think it was called vita tv yeah that's right um but i don't know i feel like the appeal of the switch so much is that I mean, it's right in the name, right? The ability for it to be a hybrid. That there's there's something yeah. about having like a portable only version. 
that doesn't feel like a cheat in the same way that having a a wired I version that had, has yeah. to stay at home. What's interesting is I feel like you and I were both uh, primarily played on the TV people um, for the first couple of years. And it wasn't really until we got the OLED uh, versions that we were like, oh, you know what? The screen actually rules um, and I don't mind playing it in handheld mode. And now I know you are primarily handheld. And I would say I go back and forth like kind of 50-50. Yeah, the OLED really did change the way that I play the Switch, for sure. Uh, okay, so uh, all, all those things that we said we weren't going to talk about, we just talked about them for five <laughs> minutes. <laughs> so that's good. Um, uh, and then we just have sort of like bullet points in more or less the order that they are presented to us. Um, and so the, the very first thing up here, and it's uh, amazing rewatching this thing. And I know we've done an episode where we've like, rewatched this uh, presentation and like reviewed it um and obviously we uh, originally reacted to it uh seven years ago so this yes this is our third episode about <laughs> one presentation um but it's such an interesting artifact and such a weird like inflection point for nintendo um and articulated in such a strange way yeah and i feel like i picked maybe because this time i was looking at it specifically through the lens of um, this episode and seeing like, oh, what did they talk about that had a big impact and what did they, that they didn't. But there were like, I don't know, things in it this time that I picked up on that like, I guess I didn't really pay attention to before or I had forgotten how it was actually presented. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's also like uh, the last time we talked about this presentation, we talked about it um, as sort of a capper to a month of talking about classic E3 presentations. So I think we were sort of in the mindset of like, here's how Nintendo did like a, a live stage presentation uh, with like real people in real time. Um, but watching it again, uh, like today to prep for this, uh, like it is sort of remarkable how much of like this big reveal and this thing that is meant to hype up the like company saving piece of hardware um, is sort of wild, right? And like, there are obviously translators working on the fly to translate what people are saying. And uh, some people are deviating from script. Some people are like telling jokes um, and like being weirdos talking about uh, Splatoon 2 and like the ink, ink like research, whatever. Um, and I just like, I know this is a little bit deviating from uh, what this episode is about, but doesn't that, it feels like Nintendo won't do that next time. No, and I, looking back on it, because they had already been doing directs for many right. years before the Switch came out, I wonder if it was for investors. Like, they could have investors there in person yeah. because they were, you know, coming off of the Wii U. They really needed some juice. And I wonder if they felt like they needed to have it in person for that reason. Um, but yeah, I yeah. don't. I don't expect them to do it for the Switch Two reveal. I expect it to be a video that just drops yeah, one day. Uh, as as do I. Um, okay. Uh, so now now uh, with that <laughs> like bigger picture question out of the way, let let now let's get to the individual features. Uh, wait, I have I have one one more one more a, a, additional. <laughs> okay, well, well for uh, for this for the episode, do we want? And we don't have to because we haven't talked about yeah. this before. I was just thinking about it. Do we want to do, like, for each of these bullet points that we're going to talk about, rate, like, on a yeah. scale, like, how this. much yes. we think that it has um, uh, delivered on that promise or how much it, like, followed the path that was laid out in this presentation? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, how, how would you feel about a binary? Like, yeah, uh, that's yes, good. this established uh, the, the pattern. No, it did not establish the pattern. Yeah, yeah. I like or that. It, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so it's, it's either going to be thumbs up or thumbs down. Uh, so the very first, the very first, very first, the first thing they say about this thing is the price. Well, the first thing it's they outrageous. say, the first thing they say that we're going to be talking about, because they, right, 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 there's all the preamble that we just did. Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the price, two ninety nine ninety nine in the US. So three hundred dollars. There were rumors leading up to the Switch reveal that it was going to be like one ninety nine, and so right. there was. Uh, I think just because, you know, we watched it. A lot of people watched it and were like, "This thing is going to be awesome." 
But there were still people that were rightfully skeptical coming off of the Wii U that it could, mm-hmm. Nintendo could turn around like they did. And they saw two ninety nine ninety nine and were like, whoa, that is too much. If this was 200, people would be into it. But at 300, I don't think this thing is going to work. Right. But, I mean, seven years later, two ninety nine dollars doesn't seem like that much money. <laughs> and it is still the price for the base model Switch, a system that has never, in its base form, never received a price cut. Yes, the uh, Switch Lite is, uh, you know, um, uh, 249 right? Or is it $200? Uh, I think a Switch, I'll look it up right now because I'm not sure. Switch Lite is cheaper and the OLED is more expensive, but the base model uh, remains two ninety nine ninety nine. I would say that this is uh, this absolutely like set the the price point and kept it forever. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the uh, Switch Lite is two hundred dollars. Two hundred dollars. Okay. But um, yeah, th- I think that's a huge thumbs up for the price. They thumbs kinda, up. They kind of nailed it. Okay, ne- uh, the next one we have up here is tabletop mode. So they talk about the different ways that you can play, you know, obviously docked, handheld, and then this third way was tabletop mode, and where, you know, you put up the, the Switch's little kickstand, and you can take the Joy-Con off, or really you could use a Pro Controller, and um, you're just using the Switch's screen to play games, but you're not holding it in your hands. And Patrick, I'm curious how much... Have you found yourself doing this over the life of the Switch? Is it is tabletop so, mode something yeah. you use often? I, I do from from time to time use tabletop mode. When we are playing a um I, I actually played a fair amount of Earthbound in tabletop mode. Um because I uh whenever I'm playing our like the classic uh console games, I like to use the classic controllers. Um, and you know, if I'm playing like an, a super NES game, like I don't always want to be like taking up the TV. So I'll just like set it up in tabletop mode and connect the super NES controller and, and play that way. Um, so I do use it a lot, but I would not say that it is, uh, like something that they have centered in like their marketing or in their software really at all. Right. Um, and, and in fact, I think that like, if you are playing a game in handheld mode or on the TV that like font size is about right, right? Because uh, if you're playing in handheld mode, you probably have it pretty close to your face and you can like read the text that's on the screen. If it's on the TV, the TV makes it bigger. You can read all the text. Whereas like if you are in tabletop mode, you're probably a little bit further away from it and it just gets a little bit too small to read. Yeah, I, I did not really use tabletop mode at all. In fact, the most that I've ever used it is probably recently when I've been um, yeah. hanging out with family and we haven't been putting it up on the big on a big TV or anything. So I've just been propping it up on a table or furniture and we've both been holding a Joy-Con and kind of, you know, been playing. Um, the only, yeah, I, there's not really, I'm trying to think of like how software could use it. Like, I feel like the closest was Labo. We used where we would yeah. like, mm-hmm. you know, have the switch because you needed it to follow the instructions but you you could do it on the tv but there was benefit to doing it in handheld or in tabletop mode or handheld mode because you could like um use the touch screen to turn the image around so that way you could see or like the model around so you could see oh wait how does this collapse into the back of like the piano and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and, and and to scrub like back and forth on like the video instructions, like as as it would demonstrate it, like that that would also be a way. And then like arguably, um, when you are actually slotting the switch like into whatever Labo thing you've built, that you are, uh, you know, like for for the piano, for example, um, that you are that's sort of in tabletop mode, right? And then the only other thing I can think of offhand is. One of the Mario Party games had a mode. It was Super Mario Party. Yeah. Super Mario Party had a mode where you could put multiple, like Switch, just the consoles themselves next to each other. Um, yeah, and it made like one larger experience, one larger, yeah, game. one larger like play field where like you s- kind of like swiped across both of them and it would connect them that way. Um, all of those examples are from before 2020. 
So like, you know, I, I, I think that uh, this was something that Nintendo like did actively pursue at least a little bit in the first couple years, but I don't like that no, no kind of third party took advantage of like tabletop mode in a real way. I'm going to put, and then also like the Switch Lite has no kickstand. Uh, so like, I'm going to say that tabletop mode gets a thumbs down for me. I don't think they actively pursued it. Well, so I guess we might have to even out at like, uh, uh, oh, okay. There's like a a neutral, okay. a, a A sideways or neutral thumb only because I feel like in, in this presentation, one of the things they talk about is like, is with two joy con and the switch itself, you can play multiplayer anywhere. Right. And right. Th- and that's and that is true. That is true. Yeah. That has remained true through the entire Switch. I don't think it's obviously like as influential as the like I think it's the lesser of the three legs on the stool of like yes, the Switch I being a hybrid. Yeah. But I do think that it's a cool feature, even if I don't ne- if I haven't necessarily taken advantage of it that much. Uh, okay, so we need a third category that it's like sort of, right? Yes, <laughs> yeah. no, or s- yes, no, or sort of. Uh huh. So, yeah, th- so let's let's give tabletop mode an S for sort of. <laughs> okay, perfect. Okay, great. Uh, next up, the touch screen. Now, this is maybe one that I would. Le- I don't. This one, this one is difficult. I'm le- like what I was going to say yes. is that I was leaning towards no. That it is. It's that definitely not yes. It's yeah. definitely not yes. <laughs> it's either it's either sort of or no. Um, because like when when I think about how how well the touch screen is integrated into the DS and the 3DS, where it was like sort of a vital part of even like the Zelda games that were on there, that like your menu was just like a touch screen menu that you were always using. And because the Switch had so many different ways to play it, and even when you're uh, playing it in handheld or tabletop mode, you probably also have a controller in your hand. Um, it just wasn't super conducive to you touching it for anything. Yeah, one of the downsides, I guess I'll say, of it being a hybrid system that it's meant to be docked on and played with a controller is that the touchscreen stuff can never be ne- like it can be it can never be necessary it for the, yeah. you know yes. like it can be I, although i guess maybe there i don't know there may be indie games or something that require you to use the touchscreen but the, sushi strikers maybe no but even <laughs> the then, way of the sushi though but but sushi strikers is a great example um or po- pocket card jockey where it's like this was made to be played yes. with the touch screen, but we have to figure out a way for you to do it with the controller, but the controller yeah. is, is not the r- like right way to play this game. And so, yeah, there, mm-hmm. there, so I agree with you. I feel like there are things that the touch screen was really good at. Like if I have to search for something in the eShop or even like enter some information, I'd much rather do it in the touch screen than um, use a controller to select every letter and all that stuff. But for the most part, the touchscreen is, uh, yeah, I, I kind of want to say no. Not really used. Yeah. yeah. Well, and like, I, I also just like, you know, the, the example that I used of like in the uh, 3DS, like Zelda remakes, um, how handy it is to just like open Link's inventory or you don't even have to open it. It was just always displayed and you would just like tap and to, to equip an item um, and like you could reasonably still do that right on a Zelda game. If you pause the uh, pause it and bring up like the menu um, and just like be able to tap something to select it, but they'd never like enable that kind of uh, navigation of those menus. Yeah. Um, even, even right away in something like breath of the wild. Um, so I'm, I, I, I want to say no on the touch screen. I, I agree with you. I think that's a no. Uh, next up, we are discussing uh, Yoshiaki Koizumi lying on the couch and playing with uh, Joy-Cons in either hand, like splayed out, where he's like, you just release the tension. Um, how many tension-releasing games do you remember playing on, on your Switch? So I, um, I don't know that I've ever really played a game with one Joy-Con in each hand. And I'm, you know, like if I'm, I'm like playing Tears of the Kingdom that way or something like that. I, I don't think I ever um, 
I don't think I ever really did that. I but I also have never bought a pro controller. I've always been a Joy-Con Which is grip person. I yeah, I've I've um I guess I've just gotten used to it and now when I play with a pro controller, I'm like, "Whoa, this thing is huge." <laughs> but you got big hands, Mark. I can't <laughs> believe you. Well, okay. Um but yeah, I mean to, it it really does like and, you know, uh, we will talk about uh, ARMS a little bit later in the presentation, but, like, ARMS was sort of, you know, the, like, a really early use case of, like, where that makes sense to, like, play a game with two Joy-Cons split like that. Um, but, like, I can't really think of another game afterwards uh, fr from Nintendo or really from anyone that, like, I mean, I guess uh, Nintendo Switch Sports... Yeah, I mean, for me, this is, like, the way I'm thinking about this is really Koizumi saying, oh, yeah, like, you could be playing Super, you could be playing Breath of the Wild or Super Mario Odyssey. Right. Just, like, laying on the couch, the right Joy-Con in the right hand, left Joy-Con in the left hand. And personally, I just can't play, like, games that require any sort of precision. Right. That way I have to be more locked in. This is going to be, this is going to be a no for me. It's, it's, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to join you on that now, especially because, like, the way Koizumi pitches it is as, like, a way to release tension, right? Uh -huh. uh, and it's, it's, it's one of those, it's one of, like, the skeezier moments in the thing where you're like, stop selling me snake oil. Like, this is a, not a feature you need to, like, sell me as a benefit. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Yeah, the way it's, like, couched in particular, I just, I can't tell if it's a joke that doesn't... That like maybe yeah, people laughed yeah. in the audience, but the audience wasn't mic'd up, so we have no idea. Or was it like a sincere attempt to be like, yes, this could be a very relaxing way to play a video game? Either way, there's a couch on stage for him <laughs> to demonstrate this. And the couch is used for no other part of the presentation. <laughs> yeah. Someone had to source that couch. Like they brought a couch on stage and someone else was like, oh, no, that couch is really not the right one. We need to get like something else that'll better fit. Koizumi like did it in rehearsal and they were like, that one's good. Let's use this couch. <laughs> All to sell a feature that isn't really real. Yep. Yep. Uh, up next, they talk about the Joy-Con motion IR camera. So this yeah. is like a little IR camera in the bottom of the right Joy-Con. And it has, it's been used a couple of times. It's been used in 1-2-Switch. It's been used in Labo. And Pretty I... Pretty extensively in Labo, really. Yes. But I can't remember otherwise the last time that this was used. Did one of the WarioWare games use it? Yes. Yes, one of the WarioWare games did use it because there was a, uh, right, where you had to, like, y like chomp, like, with your teeth? Or was that in 1-2-Switch? In one, two, I think that was we in 1-2-Switch. Like, chew switch. in front of it. Yeah, maybe it was. Um, no, there's definitely something in, in one of the WarioWare games where you have to, have to use the IR camera. Um, so maybe this one falls under the, like, sort of, but mostly not, right? It really is, like, yeah, I want to say no, but the thing that lifts it to a sort of is that w where it was used is pretty cool that, it, like, it's, mm -hmm. inc it's included in the Joy-Con, but 99% of the time, you would have no idea that it was there. And so maybe yeah. that's maybe what leans to a no for me, even though maybe, I think... Maybe it tips it to a no, yeah. I think it is cool, but I think it's some of that, like, early console hey we're gonna really yes. try to create some software that uses thi this ir camera oops nobody else cares about it and we can't figure out a way to shoehorn it into odyssey or any of our top tier titles so it's just not really a thing you know what it feels like to me it, it feels like the microphone on the ds and 3ds right where like some games, you know, like Brain Age would uh, actually listen to you saying like the names of, of numbers, right? Um, but nine times out of ten, it just wants to know if you're blowing on it or not, right? right. Yeah. Um, which like at that point, it's like, okay, it's just another button press. Uh, and I feel like in a lot of ways, this also just turned into another button press or another way to like measure distance or, uh, you know, something like that. The, the only real exception is with Labo, um, and Labo is almost like its own category of thing where 
I uh, sort of can't believe uh, how much ingenuity they uh, got out of that. Um, and that, like, I mean, the, the, the whole piano works on uh, the IR camera's ability to read different, like, the positionally different, like, reflected tape um as you like lift up the keys by pushing them down uh so i mean labo notwithstanding i think this is a no yeah to me this just feels like a classic example that happens with any video game console not just from nintendo of like a new marketable feature that in in the early life of a console maybe there's a couple of launch titles that uses it and then never again it just falls by the wayside. Yep. Yep. I agree with that. Next up is HD Rumble. The aforementioned how many uh, ice cubes can you feel inside the Joy-Con? Um, tough because obviously uh, uh, games continue to use like Rumble, uh, you know, like kind of forever. Like every first party Switch game, lots of uh, third party ones all use um uh the the hd rumble to some extent um but how much of that is different from just like regular old rumble i know this one i want to i'm i want to award a yes but on faith because we'll never <laughs> th- this is like you know when you're choosing a route in google, google maps you'll never yeah. know if you chose actually the faster one or if the other route right. would have gotten you there faster and that's how i feel about this we'll never know if non HD rumble in some of these switch games would have felt different. And to me, HD yeah, rumble just feels like rumble most of rumble. the time. Yeah. But maybe that's, that is not true. And it is actually better than it would have been if it was whatever HD rumble is. Right. Right. Well, and it like, it's hard because when it's, when it's tethered to like the joy con grip or to the switch itself, um, you're necessarily going to feel less vibration, right? It's anchored by something. Um, and so, which, you know, is why, like, part of the demonstration is uh, a game you're playing in uh, one two switch where you are just holding a single Joy-Con, right? That's where you can actually get the nuance of how many ice cubes are in this thing. Um, but, yeah, I, 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 guess, I guess I have to agree with your, like, sort of yes on faith or, like, a... a, a a, uh, a yes by default because Rumble is in everything. Right. I'm assuming that HD Rumble changed the game, and I just um, I I just don't have anything to prove that it didn't. Right. I mean the like I guess the sort of like counter example or like because uh, you know the the uh, PlayStation Five and the DualShock controller, uh, you know they touted um, uh, their own version of HD Rumble is just like you know haptic feedback and whatever. Um, and that is a little bit more impactful and maybe it's, it's like the same level of nuance or maybe even more, I don't, I don't know. Um, but they would also have like the sort of, uh, feedback on the triggers, right. That would like push back against you or like provide a little bit more resistance. The switch controllers don't do that. Um, so, I mean, it feels like it is, uh, prioritized a little less than the PlayStation dual sense, but, uh, I still think, uh, you're probably right that we just leave it at. Yes, because how, how do we know the difference? Also, it's not really fair to measure HD Rumble against, you know, a console that came out five years after it, three years after three, it. Three years after Three years yeah. after it. Also, I'm surprised that in the Final Fantasy VII remake, they don't have a mini game where you go to, like, a soda shop and they're pouring soda in glasses and you have to use HD Rumble to decide... Like to say when it's full or something like that. They should have totally uh, I mean, I, there, taken I think advantage something of something similar. There, there's, there's definitely a uh, a sit up contest that you do where you are like pushing through, like halfway through the uh, the like stronger resistance. Uh, oh, trigger, that's fun! I like that. And that to like hold it in the middle and then push all the way through. Um. So, uh, but I, I would say that it, while it was a feature in all these games, uh, was not like a gameplay feature in the way that it was. Uh, positioned in this presentation i agree with that speaking of which we roll right into start uh first party software and they start with one two switch they start with one two switch one two switch is the first game they show off for the new hardware and one two switch and i had i had forgotten 
about the way that they presented it, which is that a game mm-hmm. everyone can play together, plus it's, you know, played by looking in the eyes of your opponents, not by staring at a screen. Yes. Like, and, and, and it's very, it's clear that at this point, uh, they are, at least early in the presentation here, establishing this switch as a system that everyone can play, right? Or like they're they're chasing a little bit of that we audience, right? Like, completely. Um, which like obviously the switch achieves like reaches outside of the you know quote unquote like core gamer audience, but I don't think that it like in the end I don't think it did that. By appealing to the Wii game player, I think they just like found other ways to make classic style video games accessible to the world at large. Like Animal Crossing and Mario Kart are the examples of this. I completely agree. I feel like One Two Switch is a is it was a dead end for Nintendo. Yeah, and you can tell yeah. because everybody One Two Switch, according to the reports, you know they really struggled with developing and what to do with and how to make it interesting and different. And they ended up kind of just dumping it unceremoniously um, for a game that, you know, 1-2-Switch sold pretty well, sold millions of copies, but it just was not what the Switch, what was important to the Switch audience. Yeah, and, and, and like, you, you have to wonder if 1-2-Switch um, really just sold because people were buying a lot of Switches, largely off of the strength of Breath of the Wild, um, and were like, I need something else to play. Um, and, uh, one, two switch was there in the early days and nothing else was. Um, so uh, like, I, I, I think that's probably why it, it sold the way it did. It is interesting to put like, uh, one, two switch, everybody, one, two switch and Nintendo switch sports all in like one bucket. Obviously Nintendo switch sports is more successful, right? Like, uh, it is sold a, a bunch of, it, it's like a 10 million seller, right? Yeah. I think when we looked it up, it was close to 15 or something like that. Yeah. Um, so like, uh, uh the, you know, a runaway success, any other, uh, you know, game would be, uh, thrilled to have those, those sales numbers. Um, but like, is still not like the cultural identity of the switch, right? Yeah, definitely not in the way that we sports was right. Yeah. Right. Agreed. Uh, so what do you want to do here? You want to go? No, I think it's a no. Okay. Uh, so we're, we're gonna, we're gonna say. A no uh, on that one. Oh, I guess we... Oh, there we go. Okay, great. <laughs> All right. That's fine. Uh, we're both... We're, we're t- taking turns editing the uh, the show notes, deciding where we put the yes or the no on, on one, two, switch. Uh, I won that one. Okay, great. Um, uh, All right. Next up uh, is ARMS. Man, what... um. I think you played more ARMS than I did. I, I sure. mostly just played the demo. And uh, I it, it's another one that sold decently. I think it sold maybe like 5 million copies-ish. Like, um, but s- at least so far has been a one and done. Right. Well, and they, they did support it, right? Like they continue to put out like a DLC characters all, all for free um, and like add to the game over like, a year or so? No, that's a good point. I mean, now that I'm saying that, and from what we know about Nintendo and how they um, usually don't put out sequels on the same console, maybe it's not weird that we haven't, that we didn't get an ARM sequel on Switch. Like, maybe it doesn't, maybe the fact that there is no ARM sequel yet doesn't mean that we, there never will be an ARM sequel. Yeah, I yeah, I mean it's it's a good point. And like, you know, we obviously got uh Ribbon Girl in in Smash Brothers. So like, or no, not Ribbon Girl, uh Min Min uh, in 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 Smash Brothers. So like, uh there it's it's like a part, it's like become part of the canon. Um but like the way specifically the way they pitch Arms here as a game that is uh accessible for like everyone to play, right? And that it is using the sort of like motion control scheme but that there is like a hidden uh degree of depth um so sort of like taking the concept of uh one two switch but being like but this is also a real game um i don't 
do, do you, can you think of other examples where they did that where it's like here's a super like accessible uh, motion control or like touch control thing that also has like a lot of depth to it or is this the only example of that i feel like this is really the only example and it's an it, it's i feel like motion controls on the switch have turned out to be kind of like the touch screen but um better utilized i think but yeah gen- of course but generally speaking um it's just it's just another tool in the tool belt instead of being the selling point so and yeah. and i feel like it just adds to like the switch's hybrid nature its versatility where it's like it can absolutely do that thing if you need it to if as a developer you know for like this for skyward sword hd it's like they okay we have these motion control capabilities, so we can do it if we need to, but for the most part, you don't. You could come. You could own the Switch and never play a motion control game, um, right? And right. yeah, and that like the most the most like uh, like common and useful like uh, application of those motion controls is just like tilt assisted aiming, and that's really it. Yeah. So, what do you want to say about arms? Yes, no, sort of. I feel like it's no, I right? Think it's, I feel like it's no. All right. Uh, arms is a no from us. Uh, moving on now uh, to Splatoon 2, which, okay, this is, the, in, in my mind, this is the first, like, game targeted towards video game players, right? Like, the, the, the uh, audience that uh, was tuning into this uh, presentation to begin with, who weren't uh, shareholders of, of Nintendo. Um, and this game is introduced 28 minutes into uh, a presentation that's a little over an hour long. So they let, they took their time before introducing like a video game video game. And Splatoon 2, so I, I think Splatoon 2 would be a yes because how big Splatoon has become for Nintendo. And I think Splatoon is large worldwide, but it's huge in Japan. And yes. Splatoon has become one of the premier franchises for Nintendo. Um, so I, I think Splatoon 2 is a, is a definite yes. Splatoon, Splatoon 2 is a definite yes. Um, and just, a, you know, like to your point about like Nintendo is not, does not often release uh, sequels uh, to games on the same platform. Uh, they sure did. For Splatoon, right? We got Splatoon 2 and Splatoon 3. Both of them have had, like, huge DLC packs um, to, like, add uh, uh, a, t- a ton of new content. Um, I-, I do wonder if, like... Because part of the promise of uh, Splatoon and Splatoon 2 specifically is that, like, the Switch is a place to play online competitive games, right? And I don't know if that specific flavor of it really, um, like, played out. There is a lot more like online competitive stuff on Switch than I feel like there's been in any previous Nintendo console. So like it's better, but it's not. It's still not like up to the level of you know like uh, uh, playing on uh, Xbox or PlayStation or whatever. I think that's definitely true, but I do think that if you like the, in one of the Switch presentations, maybe it was the October you know reveal the October teaser, they, there's like a segment, or maybe it's in this one, I can't remember, that there's like a segment that um, it's like a scene of people walking into like an arena and they yeah. are eSport competitors for Splatoon. And, you know, yeah. that that was part of it. And I so I think I agree with you that Nintendo is not at the level of like, a, um, you know, an Overwatch League or something like that. But from where they were at, Nintendo has embraced esports. Right, it's leaps and bounds. Yeah, yeah for in sure. a way that they haven't before. And I imagine that'll just kind of like, in its own Nintendo protective way, continue to grow. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think in terms of like Splatoon as a game, it's yes, but maybe like uh, as a representative of uh, Nintendo's commitment to esports, uh, sort of, right? But I think we can just call Splatoon 2 itself yes, right? Yeah. I think so. Uh, and then we're kind of just throwing in uh, some other um, uh, Nintendo first-party 
uh, games that uh, were maybe not exactly introduced in this order and ne not necessarily here, but let's talk about them all here anyway, um, just to see how reflective they are of uh, what the uh, library ended up being. Um, next up, Super Mario Odyssey. Um, and it's sort of hard to know what they were pitching Odyssey as here, right? Um, other than, like, it's another, like, open world uh, or, like, open area Mario game, right? In the style of um, 64 and Sunshine. Which is a big deal because it had been a long time mm -hmm. since we had had some of those in... I don't think... And they, they point that out specifically. That's, like, the, the first one in, you know, 15 years or whatever. And I don't think that this is necessarily really the case as how, to how it came about, but it does feel like... I felt like with uh, Super Mario Odyssey and with Breath of the Wild, there was a little bit of... And maybe it was because Star Wars was going through a similar thing where it was um, these movies, the first two, like uh, The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi, that really felt like they were made by fans of, of Star Wars and were yeah. like... Um, uh, so they commenting had the, on itself sort of yes yeah. and that's what i i feel and there was a little bit of like w giving fans what they wanted and um well yeah. maybe with uh, the force awakens the last jedi <laughs> yeah you know. fans you know we could put that in yeah, quotes, yeah. yeah but um but uh, you know like breath of the wild and mario odyssey kind of have that energy for me like they feel a little bit in a way that nintendo usually doesn't I mean, Breath of the Wild, you know, surprised you and all that stuff, and so did Odyssey, but it felt very much like a love letter to Mario and a love letter to Zelda in a way that Nintendo yes. doesn't always do that. So I agree that that is true of the product that we got in October. I don't know that they were pitching Mario Odyssey as that at this presentation, right? Um, like, we get a hint of the... Uh, of that Cappy's existence, right? The eyes appear on the hat. We don't see any captures, and we don't really get a sense that, like, Mario Odyssey is, like, we don't see alternate costumes, um, and we don't see, like, any of the festival in New Donk City or anything like that. Anything that is, like, uh, celebrating Mario's uh, legacy or history or whatever uh, that the game absolutely does is not present in this little trailer here. So I don't know, like, I, I do agree with you that uh, what Switch ended up executing on uh, in a lot of games is a sort of, like, greatest hits or, like, a reflective, uh, you know, whatever for a, a lot of their series, um, and that Mario Odyssey is that, but I don't know that they were telling us that that's what it was at this presentation. That's a really good point, because it, it wasn't until June that we got, at E3, right where we got more information, we saw a jump up superstar for the first time yes. or heard it for the first time. So you're right. This is um, in this presentation. Odyssey is probably a no, even though I think yeah. it would be mm -hmm. a yes upon its release. This is my argument. This is the argument I'm making. You've, you've summarized it uh, very well. Uh, so let's, let's put a no on it. But what about, so the next one we have here is Xenoblade Chronicles 2. And this, I think, is a yes because you had one hundred percent agree. You had yes. Xenoblade Chronicles two. It was announced for you know like fall or holiday. I can't remember how they say it. Like twenty seventeen, and I remember the reaction being, "Yeah, right." Like there's no this. Yeah, is yeah, yeah. This is gonna be delayed a hundred percent, but it wasn't. Nintendo delivered it. You know, at the end of twenty seventeen, and yep. it be it was it maybe in the same way that you know one two switch was successful because it was early to the system xenoblade chronicles 2 sold really well for a xenoblade chronicles game like twice as well as any other game in the series because um there was nothing like it on switch at that point right and but that would not remain the case right um because we got xenoblade chronicles definitive edition and xenoblade chronicles 3 all came out on switch right um but like the sort of promise of, like, here's a new Xenoblade game is, like, here is a uh, type of RPG that is a first-party game. It's not a Fire Emblem game, um, and uh, but it is a, an RPG that you sort of maybe thought Nintendo was done making, 
or you know just like what, that they weren't positioning as like a, a major part of their lineup and i would say that that's one of the things that the switch has delivered on continuously from multiple directions right like that's the mario rpg remake that's the uh, thousand year door remake that's what brothership is going to be when it comes out um like and then all the other xenoblade chronicles games that that i mentioned uh and like the switch has just been a home and like a vibrant home for rpgs and like sort of more traditional or like jrpgs uh in particular like maybe even more than they realized xenoblade xenoblade chronicles 2 was a promise that they uh, were able to keep for seven and a half years straight yeah and it was such i i agree with you completely and i i think it was such an important game like you were saying to point out that like there are going to be different flavors of this. Yes, we have yes. got a lot of Mario RPGs. I mean, in the past 18 months, we have gotten, a, you know, a lot of Mario RPGs. Oh, yes. But there have been... But the fact that Nintendo was out here being like, yeah, this is Xenoblade. The, this is a flavor of RPG that we want on our system that gamers that enjoy these games can come to Switch. And um, that happened, right? Like, yeah. uh, there are so many RPGs on the system. Of all different types. So yeah, I think this is a definite yes. All right. Definite yes for uh, Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Uh, next up is uh, Fire Emblem Warriors. And we debated even like including this on the list of like things. But like we would see, uh, what, uh, two more uh, Warriors games for Nintendo first party. Um, uh, there was uh, Fire Emblem uh, Warriors Three Hopes. And the... Uh, Age of Calamity um, for the Hy Hyrule Warriors uh, that came out after this, um, and the uh, like complete edition or whatever it was called of the original Hyrule Warriors. Um, so, whatever statement they were making with this thing of like, we will supplement our uh, main IP with like sort of side series to like boost them up, like that, if that's what Fire Emblem Warriors was broadcasting. And specifically the flavor of like Musou games, uh, they delivered on that multiple times. Is it a little bit spooky that we haven't had a Musou announced? I know. For I'm a while? creeped out, frankly. <laughs> yeah. Um, I I also think that it kind of previewed what we st started to see more and more from Nintendo, and that they've stated their intention to continue continue to do, which is work with partners totally. to develop like games in that use Nintendo IP. And um, that's something... So yeah, I, I feel like on multiple fronts, this Fire Emblem Warriors is a yes. Uh, yep. Okay, so we are adding that as a yes. Uh, next up. Nintendo Switch Online and the Nintendo Switch Online mobile app for phones. Yeah, so they don't, like, dig into... I mean, Nintendo Switch Online was uh, not a paid service uh, at, at launch. Uh, and it didn't really offer much, right? It was really just like a way to play games online. Yeah, and my memory is that it didn't even launch... The Nintendo Switch Online didn't launch until later, like maybe... Oh, no, no, I guess it must have been available... Well, a form of it was available early because online play for like Mario Kart 8 Deluxe and Splatoon 2, but the... the but and ARMS, yeah. And ARMS, but the... um uh subscription service as it premiered um later that didn't come for quite some time and they they talk about that here um it, so i feel like this one's a little bit tricky because what was originally there what was it this is kind of maybe like odyssey where what was announced uh yes, is not really what it turned what it out ended to, up being yeah which ended up being like now nintendo can't stop talking about the importance of nintendo accounts and nintendo switch online subscribers and but in the beginning they weren't there yet so this is like a no not now not in this presentation but it has definitely turned into something that is very important yeah i so i i, I agree with that assessment so i think for this we should call it no right that what 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 they're pitching here is not does not end up being like an important part of the the ecosystem going forward. We have to be fair to Odyssey. It was a no for Odyssey. We have to so be fair to Odyssey. No so here. it's yes, that's right. Um, also, uh, you know, you and I obviously make good use out of the Nintendo Switch Online app, um, or you know the the game libraries. 
Uh, and yeah, obviously that's how I play uh, Tetris 99, my game of the year every year since it was released. Um, but do, what is your sense of like how the general audience, because I feel like I have a lot of friends who own Switches, play uh, Nintendo first party games and stuff, but do not subscribe to even the base level of Nintendo Switch Online. Yeah, I I, th- I think that's I think that's true. And again, it's another one that if you um if if you're not taking advantage of the library, if you don't play Splatoon 2, if you're not interested in playing Mario Kart 8 Deluxe right. Online, you know, and like maybe you subscribed for a little bit or used that 14-day tre- free trial or something to check out multiplayer with Animal Crossing New Horizons. But yeah, it's another it's like kind of like motion controls where it is possible to go to use a switch and use it really completely without paying for Nintendo Switch online. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And and, and again, it's just another thing that I find so strange because it's 20 bucks a year. It's so cheap. It's so cheap to get a Nintendo Switch online. But, uh, you know, uh, why, why much, spend the money if you're not using the features, you know? How much do you think it'll go up with the next system, if you had to guess? Do you think it'll be like 30 bucks will be the base? Or do you think they keep it at Oh, uh, that's interesting. Uh, I don't know. Like, I, I think they, they've kind of backed themselves into a weird corner now where um, they have, like, the two different, like, tiers. And, like, that's easy enough to understand, right? Like, it's still, you know would take some explaining if you're not like super plugged into the ecosystem. But I think the second you introduce a third tier, cause that's what PlayStation has right now, right? Um, PlayStation plus has three different tiers and that just becomes confusing. You know, it's like uh, one tier or, you know, like one service. Great. Easy to understand two tiers of like, I need the basic or I'm a super freak and I need it all. But like three tiers is kind of like, I-, I-, I don't know. I don't know. It's it, it, that's a dicey proposition. I think. Yeah. Well, I, I I guess I'm not promo- proposing a third tier. I'm saying the base tier goes up 10 bucks or the you know what I mean? Like so do everybody's think it on would, the base tier. Yeah, what well, do you think it would also go up then for like Nintendo Switch 1, like original Switch users? Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Um or maybe it's a thing where it's like new users uh have to like subscribe at at 30. To, I don't know. I don't know. Who knows? Uh, we we will maybe find out within the next six, six months. months? The, the, that's pro- yeah, that's probably not even that's probably not even true because those details right. will probably come way later. Would be my yeah, guess. Yeah, yeah. After you're right, like whatever right. tease for the new hardware, it would be something if they led with. Um, we're here to talk about the new hardware. <laughs> And the first and thing how, is <laughs> right. how expensive Nintendo Switch Online is going to be. Yep. Hey, I, they, la- they started this one talking about price. So, <laughs> uh, Okay. Uh, next up that we have uh, highlighted here is uh, region-free systems. No region locking on systems or games, uh, which is a first for Nintendo hardware. Yeah, it definitely was new from the previous generation. Like uh, the... We looked it up right before this to make sure, and the Nintendo 3DS was region locked. Um, the Wii U was region locked, and but yeah, this time said Nintendo said no region locking, and that even extended to Nintendo Switch Online. You know, famously, if you create mm-hmm. a Japanese Nintendo Switch Online account, um, then you can get the Famicom games, like all the ones that aren't released here. So, uh, like, how well, much and. Was- in in addition to that, that uh, uh, with the Nintendo Switch Online classic libraries, that they like have made an effort to put Japanese exclusive games in the U.S. library as well, right? And I like I also in my head kind of tie it to the Famicom Detective Club uh, remakes, right? That they're like making an effort in a way that they haven't in a long time to like bring s- specifically Japanese stuff, like to the world at large and not just represent it within Japan again. So I think there is something about the like region free nature, the global nature of the switch that they're like hinting at with the fact that nothing is region locked that they do make good on. Um, There's like a global quality to the switch uh, in a way that uh, isn't totally true uh, for um, previous systems. Yeah. 
I think this is a yes. It's a yes. A strange okay. uh, feature to uh, to discuss, but uh, we think it's a yes. So then they talk about third parties, and they specifically call out that there's over 80 games currently in development for Switch, which, looking back on now, is really funny because of the flood of software that would eventually make its way to the system. But at the right. time, you know, they specifically called out 80, and then they ha- showed this slide of all the different companies that had p- promised support or, you know, were listed as partners for the Nintendo Switch. And it's funny, you know, it has like 505 Games, Activision, EA is on here, um, From Software, Telltale, just uh, Ubisoft. It's Warner just... Brothers Games, Capcom, Bethesda. It's like, it's big, it's the big publishers. Um, Hamster is on here. You know, yeah, there's like yep. so many... But I feel like this is a regular occurrence with Nintendo in a way that I it don't is, feel yes. like uh, like Microsoft or Sony ever have to do. Like, um, you know, constantly having to reassure people that third parties are going to support their new system. Right, right, yeah. Um, because by the end of every generation, it, it proves to not be true anymore, right? Well, Just I... Just about. Uh, well, I, I mean, I would... Well... It's funny that you say that because I do think you look at this list and you're like, EA, uh, Activision, uh, yeah. uh, you know, um, Bethesda. Yes, I would say Bethesda um, did a good job. But, but I also feel like the Switch third-party support is so much better than Nintendo has had for such That's a long true. time that I wonder if they'll feel the need to tout this for the next console in the same way. I think they'll still talk about it, but I wonder if it'll reek less, like smell less of desperation. Um, right. And more right. just like, here like here are third-party games for us to show you instead right. of, um, like, we promise, please believe us this time. EA for sure, for real, is going to be supporting the Switch. Uh, what what I find uh, especially interesting about uh like this graphic and with the um you know sort of brag that over eighty games are in development from third party partners is that like the real third party support on Switch that like made the system was indie right like uh indie games are what like filled the gaps uh in the early days of the Switch and those early days stretched on for like ever like it's kind of the place to play. Um, indie games and that's not really represented here in the graphic or like the partners that they're touting like i guess marvelous is in here um uh, and inti creates um but like yeah you know maybe they just can't like anticipate the amount of support that they're gonna get from like yacht club or uh you know all the other uh, you know, tons and tons of, uh, of of indie games um even though it launches with a, a Switch exclusive Yacht Club game, but whatever, uh, in in the form of uh, Specter Knights, um, what uh, Specter of Torment, uh, but yeah, it's so this is one where I feel like it's uh, it's a sort of, I want to give yeah. this a, a medium, yeah. I I agree com- I agree completely because like you said, indie games have played such an important role in the Switch library, and third party support has played an important role but not really from the ones that they're touting here. I mean, yes, I would say Bethesda. I would say Capcom. I would say Bandai Namco. I would say Atlas is kind of a surprise, but like Activision never really showed up. Um, Take-Two outside of sports games never really showed up. Konami, okay. Um, Sega, okay. But like from from software, I think we got one. I can think of one from software game, and that's Dark Souls Remastered. Um, right which came out pretty early right and even like you you say like capcom sure but like was there here's a great question was there a new capcom game that came out on switch oh wow or is it all like collections or and uh you know remasters and stuff like that i want to say there's gotta be oh oh yeah of course monster hunter rise Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, that that's a uh, yeah, great. And like, great, like great call out there. Yeah. Monster Hunter stories. So in that way, definitely. But you're right. I mean, the vast, vast, vast majority of Capcom support on Switch has been ports 
and remasters and collections. Right. But it's and it's worked. and cloud versions <laughs> of Resident Evil Seven <laughs> and cloud versions. That's right. But yeah, I, I I'm happy to give this particular Motley Crew collection of third party partners over eighty games in development a solid somewhat. Yeah, a solid somewhat. I, I also just want to uh, like as as long as we are still on the slide that Ubisoft is on here. Um, and obviously there's the Mario plus Rabbids, uh, games, which were, uh, like big. And then also, uh, or at least the first one was big, uh, and, uh, Starlink Battle for Atlas, another game that had, uh, like Nintendo IP, uh, folded into it. So like, yeah. And then, you know, obviously like Platinum made some games that Nintendo published, right? Uh, that, um, what's the name of that game? Uh, it's like cops in the future and they're tethered together. What's the name of that game? Oh, um, yes. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yes. And, and it's um, infuriating I that neither of us can remember. Neither of us can remember it. Came um, out in 2019. <laughs> also, you're right that, um, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to think of it. I'm just going to have to let it go. Uh, Warner yeah. Brothers also has, you know, had fairly, uh, some of its ports, but, you know, Hogwarts Legacy and stuff. So I, I honestly, I would oh, say yeah. o- overall, um third parties have done a decent job on switch some more than others for sure um while you're looking that up i'm going to move on to shimigami tensei 5 <laughs> because we get a trailer here astral um, chain it's astral, astral chain. chain i got there of course it's astral chain um you know so i would put shimigami tensei 5 kind of in the same bucket as xenoblade chronicles 2 in a way like i don't think shimigami tensei 5 sold anywhere as near, near as well as uh, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 did, but the fact that it was coming to Switch and it was announced and it's like, hey, you know, like, you Shimigami Tensei freaks, this one is for you. It's gonna be right. here. That's kind of, like, a big deal in its own way. Can I actually upgrade it to yes? Because we got Personas 3, 4, and 5 on Switch as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, that that being a, a sister series slash, like, spinoff of Shimigami Tensei, uh, that, like, the fact that like this flavor of Atlas game would appear on Switch, like that, that did end up coming true. Yep. So yeah, I think that's a yes. Which speaking us- of yeses, uh, speaking of obvious yeses, Pro- Project Octopath Traveler, uh, a huge yes as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and this is one I feel like delivered basically exactly what was promised in this trailer. Right, that like this is the first time we saw HD 2D, um, and uh, you know the the fact that Square Enix would support uh, Square Enix also listed on that uh, uh, slide of uh, partners that were going to be publishing games on Switch, um, but that sort of like middle of the road uh, or like uh, like kind of double A or like you know whatever you want to however you want to describe it um, that they put out games on Switch, uh, two Octopath Traveler games, the uh, uh, Triangle Strategy, the uh, Live Alive remake, um, the uh, D- uh, Dragon Quest 3, and then, and then Dragon Quest 1 plus 2 that are all going to be coming out in the same style, like 100%. That's a yes. So next we begin to roll into this um, sequence where they're bringing people from partners on stage to say a few words. And it starts with Toshihiro Nagoshi the corporate director uh, from Sega Games. And uh, he basically just comes on stage to say, we are impressed by the Switch and we're looking forward to creating games for it. Some of these uh, look like hostage videos, right? (laughs) Another reason why I don't think they'd ever do it this way again. (laughs) Yeah. Um, uh, So I I don't know. do Do we then like go through each one of these like one by one to be like, how well did Sega deliver on this? Or is this sort of like a, a blanket thing? Oh, well, maybe we treat it as a blanket thing. Because I don't know that, you know, um, Sega obviously has been there with Atlas stuff. And they've been there with um, Sonic stuff. And they've released things on the eShop. So I, I've, but yeah, let's, let's do it all together. Because next is Todd Howard from Bethesda talking up Skyrim. But, um, and that was, I think, a big deal. They included in that teaser trailer from totally. October. Mm-hmm. I bought uh, Skyrim when it was released on Switch. The fact being able to play it on the go was such a cool idea. But then it turned out that Bethesda has been a great partner on Switch. When they were pumping out Wolfenstein games, those were all 
showing up on Switch. Mm-hmm. Um, the Doom games on there. Yeah. So I, I feel like Bethesda's been good. Even uh, as they uh, were purchased by Microsoft, right? Uh, the, to continue like games uh, coming out on Switch. Then you get Suda51, and that it's it's a, a strange sequence. Even right watching it again is just kind of bizarre because what happened? It's like Suda went off script, and so the translator was caught off guard and was having difficulty like keeping up or something like that. Yeah, it, it must be like it. It's uh, yeah, it 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 is a tough uh, little bit to follow what exactly uh, he's trying to communicate. Um, but you know, he teases Travis strikes again, the sort of like. Um, you know, interquill game between uh, um, No More Heroes two and three, uh, and the fact that we got both that game and No More Heroes three plus ports of one and two, I think that you know, if we were evaluating this one in in isolation, I'd say yeah, that's uh, one hundred percent they delivered on that. And then they bring out Patrick Soderlund, who was the executive vice president from EA, and this is one that I had wrong in my memory. My memory was that they were talking about EA generally, but he's really not. He's there he's, to talk yeah. about FIFA. And yeah. and that is one piece that like, you know, EA has not really been a big player on the Switch, but they have consistently put out the FIFA games and then the uh, football club games when they moved away from the FIFA license. They've all come to Switch. Yeah, which is pretty remarkable. It's also uh, just a weird, cool moment in the presentation uh, because we get to see Bill Trinan for the first time. Uh, he's he's translating into Japanese uh, what um, uh, Patrick Sorderland is is saying in English here. It is also funny to have EA back for the Switch reveal after they were famously part of the Wii U reveal, and <laughs> yeah, you right. know that turned out to be a whole lot of nothing. Um, but this time they were there for a very focused reason for FIFA. And they did deliver on that. So I would say overall, this also gets a, a, a yes from, from me. Yeah. They chose wisely this time, the, the partners to bring out here. Yeah. Uh, and then we kind of just close out with the, uh, you know, a, a, a little bit of fun with like Reggie and Miyamoto and uh, AJ Aonuma uh, to like show the last Breath of the Wild trailer, the one that's like the story focused trailer. Um, and, and this was uh, yeah. the big question was, you know, uh, when is Breath of the Wild going to release? When is Breath of the Wild finally going to be out? And it is excruciating how long they leave that question out there. They they pose the question before playing the trailer. They pose the question before, like, kicking it back to uh, um, uh, uh, whoever it is uh, ho- hosting in, in Tokyo. Um, and, uh, like, they just, like, they let the tension build up for so long after posing the question and before revealing that it's a launch game um, that, like, I don't know, it, it makes the trailer, which is a good trailer, right? Like, it's, it's uh, uh, you see so much of what makes Breath of the Wild special in this trailer. Um, and the music is incredible. And it makes it feel like, an epic incredible release right when you finally get that like it's it's one of the more like hyped up cool things nintendo's ever committed to a presentation um and like it just feels massively successful as a beat of publicity uh and like leading with we know why you idiots are here it's because we've got a new zelda game right and whatever else we've showed you uh with our partners or with uh games that everyone can play or whatever uh, really, this is the place to play The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Yeah, and I, I feel like this is the um, perfect capper for this presentation, which was a strong presentation and a, the perfect capper for this episode because it is a brilliant trailer. I love this trailer so much. Like you said, the music is so incredible. It sells the epicness of the game. It, yep. And it, it's just so crazy. That, and then for it to be uh, releasing the same day as the Switch is so yes. perfect because the Switch really has been Nintendo coming out with all firepower blazing from the very beginning. And that's what yes. Breath of the Wild was. Like, you're so hyped from this trailer and then to play the game and have it be as incredible as it was. Like, this is a definite yes. I feel like 
Breath of the Wild and Switch combo are the perfect promise of what the Nintendo Switch could be. Yeah, well, and we, we've talked about this on the show many times before, but, like, the fact that Breath of the Wild launches with Switch and the, the promise of the Switch is play this however you want. Play this wherever you want. You want to play it handheld? You want to play it on TV? You want to play it, you know, whatever. You can do that. We have all these different controllers, all these different options. You play it the way you want. And that's exactly what Breath of the Wild was as well. Uh, approach it in any order you want. Um, wander around. Go right for the go right for Ganondorf, like or Ganon, I guess. Calamity Ganon. Um, uh, I played the game. I know about that. I know the specifics. <laughs> I know who the boss is. <laughs> um, but uh, the, it's just like a, a perfect marriage. Uh, and the fact that uh, Zelda is um, as open and as free as it is, while also being one of the all time greatest video games, right? Um, is uh, this like happenstance that makes you associate uh, the the switch with the best gaming has to offer, um, and the fact that they're able to execute on it again several years later with Tears of the Kingdom uh, is like I I don't like yeah just one hundred percent this uh this is the DNA of the Switch is yeah, Breath it, of the Wild. It just felt like a reinvigorated Nintendo. Um, yes, which I think is like not in some ways not a true narrative because this game also released on the Wii U. You know what I mean? Like yep. mm -hmm. the, the the brilliance was there. It wasn't the switch that brought it out, but the timing of it was perfect to just feel like uh, there was an excitement around the switch around Nintendo for the launch of this that there had not been for so many years. Um, it, yeah. it was, it was just a very different environment and listeners, if you have not recently watched the, that breath of the wild trailer from the January presentation, yeah. I really, it's just, it's just a good one. It's just, it's yeah. a good one. It just plays like, I don't know what to tell you. It's just good. Um, which like, so, okay. You know, we, we talked a lot, uh, so, so far as, as we've been going through this about, um, how like the a lot of the other sort of announcements or like game reveals are like interesting or like uh seem like they would be like kind of fun right like we um but like they 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 wait until the end of the uh, presentation to drop the megaton announcement to have like the one big undeniable thing and i feel like without the one big undeniable thing this presentation is fine right like it's 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 an encouraging presentation, um, but until you get to uh, Breath of the Wild, it's not amazing. Do you think Nintendo's gonna have a bomb to drop when they reveal the Switch Two? I wonder. I don't know that they. Well, first of all, I I I don't know that I agree with you that it it's just an okay presentation leading okay. up to it. And maybe maybe it's because maybe in hindsight you're right, but at the time I think based on where Nintendo was and what they were showing here, where it was like, okay, we didn't know that much about Odyssey, but we knew it was coming in 2017 right. and Splatoon yeah. 3 was in 2017. And, you know, like they had so Splatoon 2, but yeah, yeah sorry, Splatoon 2. They had so, and then Xenoblade Chronicles 2 and arms and Mario Kart 8 deluxe. Like they had so many things after so many years of Nintendo having long stretches without games that I remember leaving this being like, whoa if they can pull that off like yeah you know like we said with uh xenoblade chronicles 2 everybody was like i'll believe it when i see it there's no yeah. way this is coming out actually at the end of the year and so i do think breath of the wild was like the the kicker for sure but and now knowing what else what would happen with the switch i think you're right that it's you know like you're like arms eh, everybody wants to switch okay but at the time i remember just being really impressed and really excited coming out of it yeah, yeah, and me, me too. And I, but I, I do think that like a lot of that, uh, is if not because of it is very bolstered by the fact that Breath of the Wild like caps the thing off. And I guess like we Breath of the Wild had been in development for so long, and we'd seen a bunch of cool trailers and like little uh, peeks at it. Um, people have been playing it at the E3 previous. Um, so like the hype for it was already pretty high. Um, but like. Uh, so, you know, what, wh where Breath of the Wild was, uh, you're going to land like a hammer no matter what. Um, and, uh, it's just maybe fortunate that they were able to tie it to the release of, of, of this system. Um, 
But still, that uh, I still it still keeps driving me back to the question: Do you think that the uh, that they will not release like another uh, generation of hardware without having a uh, just megaton bomb like Breath of the Wild? Yeah, it, it's like, do they feel like they need to, or? Uh, so yeah, but maybe they do. Like maybe they want to try to re- replicate the success that they had with that first year of Switch. And you know, first parties have been the first party developers have been kind of quiet for about yeah. a year, and so it seems very possible that they are planning to, you know, have another 2017 in 2025. Uh, <laughs> have another 2017 in 2025. Uh, all right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and I, I don't, I don't know. I think it's, I do think it's, an, uh, I agree that that's probably what they uh, want. Um, but like, because I, I don't think it'll be uh, uh, Metroid Prime 4. I think Metroid Prime 4 is going to come out on uh, o- o- OG Switch. Uh, and uh, will be a very good game, but w- is not going to be a megaton. Um, but like, they don't have something else like that where it's like, as soon as they announce the next blank, people are going to lose their minds. Um, I, I don't think. Th- I think 3D Mario is probably the closest. Yeah. Do you think Mario Kart fits in that slot, or is that just like that? Kind of feels like a given, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I think. The new Mario Kart will be a big deal, but I don't see it on the same level. I mean, it seems silly to say because Mario Kart 8 Deluxe is the best-selling game on the Switch and continues to sell millions of copies like right. every year. But in, in, in that way, it's like a utility, right? Where you're like, yeah, electricity rules, but like, <laughs> we, you have to have it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think you need, you need something that will get like the enthusiasts, for lack of a better term, talking. Yeah. And it's not going to be a new 3D Zelda, probably. That would be really shocking. It's, but it could be a new 3D Mario. Yeah, yeah, and that and that could very well do it. Um, okay, so uh, do we want to try to like apply an overall like was this presentation uh, accurate or like representative of what the Switch would become, or is that too hard? I don't think we need to be like super mathematical about it, but I am interested just in your gut take. Uh, you know, after watching this again. Do you think that the presentation is a accurate representation of like what the switch would become? So we said a lot of yeses here later in the presentation, but I just want to underline that it took us 28 minutes to get to Splatoon 2, right? Um, and so in that way, them sort of front-loading this thing with like motion control games and like games that are easy for everyone to play because they're motion control. I'm I'm going to say no. I'm going to say that this presentation like kind of up until the end when uh they show Zelda uh like doesn't really lock into what the switch was going to be. But that's that's how I'm feeling, Mark. How do you feel? Yeah, I I'm leaning t- more towards a yes. I think you're right that like the one two switch part of it in arms like that didn't really come together in the way that they were kind of touting it as a driver for the switch. But I would say overall, like the twenty eight minutes. <laughs> but but bef- but like the but what they really nailed is the stuff before that, which is the stuff sure. that kind of glossed over the um the Joy Con, the docking, like all that kind right. of stuff. Plus, you know, you get into the software that we are hyped about. I don't know. I lean more. I lean more towards yes. But maybe this is an area where we cancel each other out and we're like, sort of, in some ways they nailed it. And yeah, just like any, right. other, any other system, in some ways they couldn't have expected, you know, what was going to take off in the way that it did. And so they, they didn't talk about it because they had no way to anticipate it. Yeah, they didn't even mention Ring Fit Adventure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, uh, Mark, let's close this out. Would be interested in hearing uh, listeners' thoughts uh, if we uh, like overrated the uh, relevance of some of these things here or underrated them. Uh, you know, write to us Nintendo Cartridge Society at, at gmail.com. gmail.com or get in the Discord and uh, chat with us there. Okay, that is going to do it for this episode of Nintendo Cartridge Society. Thank you so much to our 16-bit patrons, Connor McKay, Patrice Millette, and Kyle Seaborn. We appreciate you. We appreciate everyone. 
who is uh, supporting us on Patreon or listening to this episode right now. Um, join the Discord if you haven't. And Anthony DeLuca made our logo. Our theme music is provided by Ape at Betty. You can get more of his music by going to apeatbetty.com or by listening right now. From my co-host, Mark Mitchell, this is Patrick Ellers saying thank you for listening.